Actually, first of all, in Prabhupada's system, we'll chant by the one of them. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Vihari Gopi Jana Varava Kirivara Dhari Gopi Jana Varava Jasa Udanandana Raja Jana Randana Natira Manachari Natira Manachari Radha Madhava Kunja Vihari Gopi Jana Vallava Girivar Dhari Gopi Jana Vallava Girivar Dhari Dastoda Nandana Vraja Jana Randana Dastoda Nandana Vraja Jana Randana Dastoda Nandana Vraja Jana Randana Dastoda Nandana Vraja so, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 2. Hmm. Text 24. Can you tell Brahma too that we can hear him? Yeah, it's a whole time. I know that's not like it, but it's so. <laughs> oh, it's coming. It's on the phone. I know. So, Vaishwanaranam. So, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Vaishwanaran Yati Bihaya Sagata Su Shumnaya Brahma Patena Shochisha Viduta Kalko Ta Harer Udaskat Prayati Chakram Dripa Shaishumaram. This is a very technical, sort of mystical, astronomical information. I'm waiting. <laughs> so Vaishwandara means the controlling deity of fire. Uh, yati, the yogi goes, Vihayasa, by the path in the sky, the Milky Way. Gataha, passing over Sushumnaya by the Sushumna. Brahma, Brahmaloka Patena, on the path of Brahmaloka, Brahma Patena, Shochisa, which is effulgent, illuminating, Viduta, being washed off, Viduta Kalka, so the contamination, the impurities are washed off, Atta, thereafter, Harer, of Lord Hari Udastat, Upwards, prayati one goes, uh, and uh, chakram. Prayati one goes to the chakra nirpa okay, shishumaram, named shishumaram. So let's see what this means actually. So we'll chant it first. Vaishwanaram yati bihaya sagata. Vaishwanaram yati bihaya sagata. Vaishwanaram Yati Bihaya Sagata Vaishwanaram Yati Bihaya Sagata Sushumnaya Brahma Patena Shochisha Sushumnaya Brahma Patena Shochisha Sushumnaya Brahma Patena Shochisha Sushumnaya Brahma Patena Shochisha Viduta Kalkota Hare Rudasta Viduta Kalkota Hare Rudasta Viduta Kalkota Hare Rudasta Viduta Kalkota Hare Rudasta Priyati Chakram Nirpa 
So, O oh king, when such a mystic passes over the Milky Way by the illuminating Shushumna to reach the highest planet of Brahmaloka, he goes first to Vaishwanara, the planet of the deity of fire, wherein he becomes completely cleansed of all contaminations, and thereafter he still goes higher to the circle of Shishumara, which means uh, baby killing, actually, or the baby death. Interesting. Uh, to relate with Lord Hari, the personality of Godhead. So Prabhupada's purport. The polar star of the universe and the circle thereof is called the Shishumara circle. And therein the local residential planet of the personality of Godhead, Kshiro Dakashayi Vishnu, is situated. So Kshira, I think nowadays you need to say Kir or something, it means like milk. And Udaka, like a sea, the milk sea. Shai means lying in, so lying in the milk sea. Shiro Dakashayi Vishnu. Before reaching there, the mystic passes over the Milky Way to reach Brahmaloka. And while going there, he first reaches by Swanara Loka, where the demigod control, controls fire. On by Swanara Loka, the yogi becomes completely cleansed of all dirty sins acquired while in contact with the material world. <laughs> the Milky Way in the sky is indicated herein as the way leading to Brahma Loka, the highest planet of the universe. So clearly, this is sort of a different scale because the Milky Way is pointing toward the highest planet in the universe. Of course, according to the latest astronomy. And of course, it's always possible that in the future, they will discover something they didn't know that will change all the numbers, right? And that could happen. So anyway, according to their current knowledge, uh, the Milky Way is just the local galaxy. Is that correct? It's our galaxy. Yeah. And how many galaxies do they say now? Is this Billions. Billions? Yeah, so many. It's a big, it's a big production, isn't it? Huh? It's a big production. Yeah. So, uh, so actually in the sky, our, the Milky Way is the name of our galaxy, and the sky, you can see this. Yeah. Like, Milky, that's why they call Milky Way. Of course. Way the Via Lactea. Yeah, the projection of our... So how is it that we're inside it, but we see it? Hmm? We, no. are, we are inside the Milky Way, but because, we see it. Because we are inside a, 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 a big spiral galaxy, like with a big All right. flat pizza. <laughs> and it's made by under billions of uh, little stars, stars, little or big or small. And then we are inside it, and when seeing, on so the, we're just seeing the part of the top. perimeter. Yeah, yeah not, not only the perimeter. So you, when we see a lot right. of two then we have we we got all the. the but we're only looking at one side of it if we're in the middle of it. Where is the Earth in the no, Milky Way? We, we can look in all sides. So around us. Yeah, we, yeah, because we are moving around the sun, so we we got all the parts of that during the sequence. During the night time, obviously we see that only during the night time. Oh. So we got different parts of the Milky Galaxy, different moments of the year. But it's just on the north side or on the south side? You can see it's flat. We can see. Yeah, but all I the think stars, all the stars, stars we see, see. You know, during the night, uh, they are parts of our galaxy. All of them. We cannot see all of them, obviously, because some are, are little and very far. So, but all the stars we see, they are, are stars of our galaxy. So you need a powerful telescope to see other galaxies. Yeah. You can see my naked. My naked eye, you know, in a very black sky, you can see one of the nearby galaxies. It's, it's very big. Andromeda galaxy. You can see just a little, you know, like blur. It's an amazing creation. It's funny because you know, in the Bhagavatam, you get these descriptions of the universal form, but 
it's actually modern astronomy, which really is awe-inspiring, isn't it? I mean, in terms of seeing or hearing about a physical or cosmic manifestation that just uh, completely fills you with awe, it is like that, isn't it? Even the astronomers are like awestruck, isn't it? I mean, they themselves were astonished. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and they keep coming across the phenomenon, the more they know, the less they know. Yeah. Constantly. Yes, because yeah. you have to know a certain amount to realize what you don't know. It's like if you live in some remote village where everyone thinks the same way, you think you know everything. Yeah. It's not until you start to go outside and have different experiences that you realize you know very little. So it's interesting, all this sophisticated astronomy, modern astronomy is now showing us that we don't know very much, isn't it? The universe is more complex, which is more fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, well, um, I mean, your Dorian know better, but now they're questioning their dark matter calculations. So, so they, they, they don't know what they don't know and they don't know. Well, if you don't know what you don't know, that's a problem. But now they're starting to know what they don't know or yeah. that they don't know it. It, it, it. Yeah, layers of don't know this. So then, um, so it's possible that, there, that what, are, what are the other possibilities if it's not dark matter as they have understood it to this point? That's a curatory question. What else might it be? The other possibility, one of the more accredited is that uh, the gravitational law is not well understood. So it's an. So a rather than dark matter, it just may be that the laws of gravity are complex. Yeah, more complex than. Yeah. But even worse, now we are seeing an, an anisotropy in the acceleration. What? Anisotropy means that. You, you you see here and you get an acceleration of the universe. You see another side as another acceleration, different, an homogeneous. In other words, the laws of nature are don't seem to be the uniform as it were. Yeah, the more as you said, the more you research, the more fantastic the universe is. As many you know. So it's it's actually much more complicated than people thought, say, a hundred years ago. Yeah. The complicated to understand and more beautiful, and we are now with this James Webb Space Telescope. We've got these images of very, you know, okay, it's amazing. It's so complex universe. Oh, by the way, that's interesting. There, there is a, a research going on for ten years. Now they completed it, and we understand now that we are in a big bubble of empty space in our galaxy with all stars in the surface of this big bubble and we are in the in the center, the precise center. Our little solar system is in the precise center of this big empty space, bubble of empty space. And no one can understand how this could happen because <laughs> how can it be it's this coincidence that we are in the center. You know, this remembers me the the cosmic egg. It reminds the, you that it reminds me, yeah, the, the Bumanda, you know, this. So there could be something special about our solar system. Should be. Because this empty space is made by the supernovas. They are exploding and, you know, like, like cleaning the space. So how can our little sun, you know, like be just in the middle of it? <laughs> Yeah, Actually, so in other words, so Gary Dari so it would be fair to say that even from their point of view, the scientists are starting to realize that they're just scratching the surface of actual cosmology, that there's like, there's just like an inconceivable amount of information they're not aware of. Yeah. And, and is and that true? I th yeah, for sure. And then they consider they just discovered a, uh, well, the closest black holes to us, 2,000 light years away. 
So it, it's, a, it's a very significant black hole, kind of close to us, but still 2,000 light years away, which means that by, uh, unless we become a mystic yogi, there is no way to ever explore it, impossible. And um, the graviton, which may or may not exist, but the particle that generates gravity, maybe I'm misstating it, um, in order to observe it, we need instruments 100,000 times uh, more precise than anything we have now which may or may not be possible. So we're reaching certain limits of what we can know. And, and some of these limits, uh, uh, the laws of nature say we can't exceed it. I mean, for example, there is no way to travel a thousand light years, even one light year. There's just no way to travel that way. It's not possible, uh, only in uh, science fiction. Am I right, Giridari? Warp speed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it just doesn't, well, it exists for Narada Muni, but not for the rest of us. It would have to be a completely different way of traveling, like, it, it, in other words, it wouldn't be based on the gross laws of physics. Yeah, it, it, it's not, it, 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 it's, yeah, it reaches a level of impossibility. So, um, for, yeah. for that mode of science. Exactly. It, it, we, we just can't. I mean, you know, we can travel to the edge of our solar system a little beyond. That's it. And even to go to Pluto, my God, that would be a what? very long trip. The Voyager went past Pluto. How long did it take to get there? What is that, about 30 years it took to get there? Something or 50. Or something like that. Thirty. That means a human being, the same person, can go there and come back. You'd have to send, let's say, families that produce children, raise them, and their children might come back. Yeah. Yeah. A voyager isn't even coming back, so that's that. Interesting, because so it's what you said. I'm just, you know, just sort of restating what both of you said that now science is coming to the point where they're discovering. It's almost like, let's say you're like, uh, you live in a little village and you climb one day to the top of the hill and you look out and you see just like, you know, miles and miles and miles of towns and this and that, things you didn't know existed before. But it's, so, so they're realizing that they're, they're, they're learning enough to know they don't know. And that's very difficult to know. It would take some completely different type of technology or approach, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, that's interesting because it seems to me that's an obvious opening for us because if science now knows that with our present technology, we just, there's all these important things we can never do. And here's all this ancient literature saying there's a different way to do it. Exactly. So it's like, you know, desperation can make people open to things they might not consider. And, and then when you develop some correlations with ancient literature and modern astronomy, like Sada Puta's done, Giridari has done work that way, it gives people faith that maybe there's something really there. And of course, what the Bhagavatam and some of the other literatures are describing is a completely different type of technology. Completely different kind of technology. I mean, performing a fire sacrifice and producing living beings or producing mountains or producing this and that just by vibrating certain sounds into a fire. It, it's, it's, um, it's interesting because if you compare two very famous movies, you see two very different approaches to technology. One is Star Wars and the other is Lord of the Rings. What really struck me is that in Star Wars, all the technology is very industrial. Like even begins with this metal space cruiser just coming over your head, which is clever, George Lucas. But it's, it's still, it's very industrial. It's metal, it has rivets and there's, you know, it has like, there's like fire coming, you know, an exhaust coming out. It's just sort of 
at very advanced, but nonetheless industrial metallic technology. And yet, and then if you look at Lord of the Rings, it's more like magical where the technology is much more subtle. You say certain mantras, you yeah. touch certain things. And so even between these two movies, you see very two different, very different conceptions of technology. You throw a ring, you throw a ring into the fires of Mordor, and then, uh, you know, all kinds of, and it's interesting because the American film, Star Wars, is just, it's very American because America doesn't have a cultural history of, you know, elves and uh, all these things, whereas Europe does. Because if you think about it, America, America, I mean, first, of course, you get a little colony in Virginia in the 1500s, just a, you know, a couple of people trying to figure out how to plant tobacco. But, um, but by the time you get like the Massachusetts Bay Colony, we're already well into the Enlightenment. I mean, not well into the Enlightenment, it's this early 1600s, but certainly the age of reason and the scientific revolution. And so America, and because they were also, this is interesting, because Americans were also the early people, they were almost all Protestants. The only Catholic colony was Maryland, but all the other colonies were Protestant. And so therefore, you know, they're again, I mean, they don't, I mean, the Protestants back in those days even reject the sacraments of the Catholic Church. I mean, they don't want anything magical. They don't want anything supernatural. They don't even want you know, wafers turning into the body of Jesus or something. Or, you know, wine being the blood of Jesus. They don't want anything magical, anything. And, and that's why the Industrial Revolution and the Scientific Revolution take place in Northern Europe. It starts in Southern Europe in the Renaissance, you know, people like uh, Galileo and people like that. But then the Scientific Revolution, and of course, the applied science was called the Industrial Revolution. It's just the applied science of the science revolution. And the reason it sort of moved to Northern Europe for one, for two reasons. Well, for, well, actually one main reason that is because the church had power in Italy and they didn't want to share the power with the, they didn't want these new ideas. They didn't want this new technology kind of taking away their authority. And so therefore it's not by chance that the industrial revolution, in fact, Max Weber wrote a whole thesis on this, that the industrial revolution took place, the scientific revolution in Northern Protestant Europe. It didn't take place in Spain, even though Spain in the 1500s was the richest country in Europe, most powerful country. And then after the defeat of the Spanish Armada, that started to shift, but, so that's why the industrial revolution, the scientific revolution, did not take place in Spain. I mean, who are the famous Spanish scientists and you know leaders of industry? Spain, Italy, Greece. It's because it took place in the Protestant countries, where all they cared about was you know material facts and the Bible. And so that explains why. And then so so it's that Protestant, heavy Protestant. In fact, the Puritans were called Puritans because they wanted to purify the Church of England from all its Catholic tendencies. They thought, they thought the Church of England, they thought Protestantism in England was too Catholic. And too mystical. Well, yeah, too, uh, yeah, they're magical or, you know, all these things. I mean, they have a certain, yeah, mystical, the difference between mystical and magical. They thought there was all this, you know, too much. Yeah, just all, they just wanted the facts and signs. <laughs> so, and so they, so in Northern Europe, they tried to change the world, not by, you know, hoarding saint relics or by, you know, giving money to a priest, but by science. And that's why if you look at the age of reason or the enlightenment, which was probably centered in France and the French revolution had two tendencies, it was very much like, you know, rational and all that. And it was anti-religion, they killed the priests because France had been a Catholic country. I mean, so, so it's interesting. So that's why in America, so it's the it's the Protestants who come to America and set the tone. And therefore, 
that explains Star Wars. That's why the American conception of like a fantastic world is all industrial. Interesting. Whereas the England, which you know, goes <laughs> way back, you know, thousands of years before the scientific revolution, thousands of years before Protestantism, that's why the English movie, Lord of the Rings, or you know, or the what are the other ones? There's another famous one. There's also that one with the um, was it C.S. Lewis? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Nar 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, that. yeah. That's why in England, to this day, uh, they, uh, yeah, they make movies like that with magic, and and uh, Harry Potter. Yeah, yeah. Whereas you wouldn't. That's why it comes from England, not America. Interesting. So, in that sense, also, sometimes in you know in England or even in Germany, they're more amenable to even intelligent design. But it's also popular in America, and that's why. Anyway, I won't go into like Anglo Anglo philosophy with Bertrand Russell. But anyway, go too far afield. But um, but you can see it. That's why through history. You can actually see why people have certain attitudes, and that's why there's this historical background for a science institute because people chose certain modes of or certain conceptions of science, like scientism, that has to do with history. It wasn't a logical conclusion. It's not that some objective people just sat down and thought about it and thought, okay, physicalism should be the philosophy of science. That's that's ludicrous. They thought that because church, the church, and especially the Catholic Church, had interfered with science. So these things didn't happen in a vacuum. But because scientists do not study history, do not study philosophy, that's why they, not all of them, not even most of them perhaps, but the physicalists, that's why they make such fools out of themselves, because they're so ignorant of history and philosophy. I, I was listening to, um, I was saying this, I'm just trying to recall, discussion of Earl uh, B.I. and the um, point uh, Prabhupada was making was that um, uh, the B.I. should be integrated um, in, in the humanities and science. Yeah, and humanities. Who's yeah, yeah, humanities and science. Just trying to remember who, where the quote was from. I'll think of it. And um, um, then, oh yeah, yeah, it was an interview with uh, Subhadamadar Maharaj, and uh, Subhadamadar said, "Well, because I was a scientist, um, uh, the BI it narrowed into science, but that wasn't Prabhupada's intention." That's a significant. Yeah, and because you can't even understand scientific theories unless you understand the historical context, and the historical context includes the intellectual history. Yeah, yeah, and Shutabda was, was noting that he, he said it was his shortcoming that he said I'm really not much of a scientist either, but that was all I knew. So the BI got more narrowly focused than Prabhupada intended. Yeah, well, and Prabhupada also was saying life comes from life, which, but because the scientist is not a scientist first. The so-called scientist, first of all, a human being that lives within society in a particular historical period. You know, and, and, and scientists tend to get married, raise children, vote in elections, and they have all kinds of views. And it's not that there's this sort of watertight, airtight, you know, like division. So when I go to the lab, I stop being a human being. You know, everything that's going on in my life has nothing to do with my emotional responses to things. There's this, um, actually, this alienation, which was a big word back in the 20th century with, you know, existentialist philosophers and everything. 
you can see it that two groups of people who became sort of absurdly alienated from society, one was the scientist, the other one was the artist. The idea that sort of like, because you had the, you had the enlightenment, this super emphasis on rationalism and science, which by the way, Charles Dickens kind of mocks in the opening sentences of Hard Times, if you read that, facts, facts, I want facts, like I don't want any emotions, I don't want any sort of physicalism. But the point is that, um, oh, so the artist, before, you know, that's what you do for a living. Like, you know, you paint pictures or you do this or that. And of course, if someone was extraordinarily good, like Da Vinci or Michelangelo, then they would be recognized. But still, um, so then you have the Enlightenment, which you know, which only cares about empiricism and log logic chopping, and there's a reaction against that, you know, dialectic, you know, like the pendulum swing, and the reaction against all that materialistic, you know, logic and science is romanticism, and that's why in the late 1700s and in the early 1800s you get this romanticism which is say no, that there are very important truths, the most important truths you don't understand by mathematics, and by empirical experiment, but you know, by feeling and nature, and nature is not just something to be, you know, scientifically studied, manipulated so that we can open factories and everything. Nature itself is uh, an object, an enlightening object. And it's funny because if you look at the main uh, romantic poets, say in England, like Shelley, Wordsworth, Keats, uh, I've forgotten them now, um, there's five of them, Byron. Byron, yeah. Yeah, that if you look at them, almost all of them, I think, were all, they, they were atheists. I didn't know that. Yeah, so it's interesting. So it's not that they're not, they don't want to just go back to the way the world was before the Enlightenment because they buy into, I hate those capitalist metaphors, they actually accepted the uh, the atheism of the French Enlightenment. And yet they say, okay, so now that we agree there's no God, or at least there's no God that we're interested in, then, um, so now let's, it's just a different approach to understanding reality without God. One approach is the empirical approach. The other approach is just by communing with nature. And nature is, it's almost like this, you know, like that foolish idea of Spinoza. I mean, it's right, it's anyway, I don't wanna get into Spinoza now, but. So, so then you have romanticism and, and part of, and, and so therefore in the romantic period, the artist, the one who's highly sensitive, and you see actually Jane Austen laughing at this in Northanger Abbey. And uh, you see her laughing at it in the in Sense and Sensibility with Marianne Dashwood, where her you know romantic, artistic sense, emotional sensibility is almost, literally almost killer. And so, and so in both cases, you sort of like anyway, like nature. You know, we commune with nature and we understand things. So the real way to understand nature is not by empirical science that leads to factories and the destruction of, of, of human sensibility. The real way to understand nature is poetic, artistic. And, and you understand something about nature that uh, is somehow more real, more important than all the chemistry and physics in the world. And so, so, so in, in that period, the artist, the artist becomes sort of becomes elevated and takes the position of an Old Testament prophet. And then you get this sort of cockeyed, you get this, I mean, often crazy idea, the artist as the misunderstood genius who sees reality. So if an artist just takes a, a metal bar and twists it, it somehow, he's, he or she's communicating some incredible cosmic truth that we just can't understand and we have to study it. Med when actually it's just some fool that bent a piece of metal. And so you get the artist, not simply as a craftsman, but the artist as the sort of this 
mystic, higher consciousness person who can't really explain what he or she is seeing, even though it's so profound. And people stand before some modern art, there's like some patch of paint on a canvas and just, you know, well, I'm seeing this. And so it's just, it's kind of like this donkeyish, stupid humanism or a bunch of fools that don't know what they're talking about. So if you call their bluff and you look at a piece of modern art and say, okay, what's the artist saying? Let, let, let's stop, you know, hiding behind this screen of, well, you know, it's so deep. No, just, you know, if the artist knows something and is trying to communicate, it, what is it? If you got a truth, speak your truth and stop pretending that there's something profound behind it. And so you can see how with the atheism that began with light, it sort of goes in these two directions. One is empirical, one is artistic. Anyway, I mean, there's a million other things to talk about, but- um, It's good stuff. Yeah, so therefore the fact that certain people come up with certain forms of scientism or, 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 or you know, the powers, that their, their beliefs in the power of science, because ultimately it's based on faith because you have no proof that science, let's say, will find a cure for a particular disease, as many diseases they, they haven't found a cure for, but it's, it's a faith. You believe that the empirical method, that laboratory experiments or, or telescopes will somehow lead to a blessed state for humanity. And yet you don't know that's true. You could say a Christian, you, you don't really know Jesus is going to save you. Well, science doesn't really know that science is going to save you. And plus this sort of messianic vision of science, that science will save us, science will cure all of our disease. I mean, it's done some good, but it, it's almost like an appropriation of a type of Christian faith. Yeah, you know, Jesus saves, empiricism saves. So in terms of psychology, the people, they're, they're, the way they are as human beings, it's the apple doesn't fall far from the tree and either the artist or the scientist or anyone else doesn't fall far from the nature of the culture in which he or she lives. And that's why they come up with these like, yeah, I mean, there's real science. Like when you go to the dentist, that's real science. Or when you turn, you know, when you turn on your car, you know, the engine starts and you drive, that's real science. Your GPS is real science. Everybody more or less in their world, they, they become the authority. Science. Or they accept someone as authority. Close so, um, but the physicalism has nothing to do with science. It literally, it's not only is it not science, that's nothing to do with science. It's just some whimsical, bad philosophy that was adopted fanatically by people trying to escape fanatical religion. Yeah, the pendulum. Yeah. It's a pendulum or, you know, I, I'm trying to, because I'm a scientist, I love science, so I'm trying to anyone, tempted. Any, tempted any way to all. Just to give some, you know, uh, you know, science save, saves us from uh, the scientific method, say, save us from foolishness, actually. No, real science is Krishna conscious. Because real science, when I mean, think of it, in, in the word conscience, there's the word science. So real science is just knowledge. I mean, who could be against knowledge? Who could be against knowledge? And real science is knowledge. So no one's against knowledge, or someone is against knowledge, they're just a fool. What we are, what we are opposing is ignorant materialism. And the fact that materialists have stolen science and therefore they've polluted it because we are actually, this is why I keep making 
at this point in made the Kunal, the BI is trying to purify science of bad philosophy. We're not trying to say that, you know, every scientist has to chant Hare Krishna, but also they shouldn't chant nonsense like saying that evolution occurs without God because that claim has nothing to do with science. All a scientist can say is that we have a fossil record, we date things in a certain way, our dating methods appear to be reliable, and therefore they're sort of like this, what do they call it, this ladder or this scale of being simple creatures, more complex with, as we know, the famous anomalies pointed out by Siddhartha Buddha and Druta Karma. So that's all you can say. To say that this occurred by itself is a totally non-scientific claim. That claim has nothing to do with science. It is completely outside the realm of science. It is simply polluting science with one's own fanatical religion or beliefs. And so we want real science. We want pure science. The BI stands for pure science. And we want to free it. I mean, as much as we don't want flat earth Christians polluting science. We don't want uh, sort of stupid physicalists polluting science either and just making a joke of it because it's completely, first of all, that statement that this happened by itself is not a scientific statement. It has nothing to do with science. And secondly, it's increasingly idiotic as science, as real science, discovers more and more of the almost infinite complexity of biological engineering. The absence of uh, science, it becomes false uh, in the contradictions. No, real science is true, or at least it's the best. Even if you have a scientific theory and later it turns out to be, has to be adjusted, but you could say based on rational methods, it's the best understanding to date. It's just the best understanding right now. And hopefully it will lead to a better understanding. Real science is not a problem. Real science is a gift of God. Actually given by God. Gift of God in Sanskrit is Deva Dutta. So real science is a divine gift. And that's how Newton understood it. That's how uh, Copernicus understood it, Kepler, Galileo. You know, the atheists try to claim Galileo, but he's not on their side. He just famously said that the church can tell us how to go to heaven, not how heaven goes. And so, um, yeah, we are actually demanding that science be purified of religious beliefs because physicalism is a religious belief as I've explained as I've proven logically because if you say let's say two and two are four or if you say two and two are not five or if you say those are both mathematical statements if you affirm something or deny it they're both in the same realm of discourse if you numbers you cannot if you're a teacher and you give a spelling test, you cannot mark a word wrong, misspelled, unless you know the correct spelling. So if you say that no God designed evolution, that's as much a religious claim as saying that God did design evolution. The positive and the negative are both in the same realm of discourse. Therefore, to say that God did, there's no God that designed evolution is a religious statement. And we want religion out of science. That's our position. We want religion out of science. We are actually more committed to pure science than these, than these atheistic scientists because they're mixing religion and science. We have to shout this from the rooftops, isn't it? Good point. We have to be aggressive. We have to just, you know, I mean, you know, get out the boots. 
<laughs> and who can you see? And and let let them try to refute that. They can't, because it's philosophy, and they're like you know. They don't know philosophy. To say that evolution occurred without some kind of designer is a religious claim. And we and we and we don't want religion and science. Powerful point. Yeah, that's the real point. That's the real slogan of the BI. I like that. What's it? What's it? What do you say? That we want religion out of science. We want real science. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I mean, frankly, when I go to the dentist, when I go to the doctor, when I go to get an exam, I want real science. I don't want Christian medicine. I don't want Vedic medicine. You know, it's, I mean, I have disciples, several of them who actually died from curable diseases because they have two religions, Krishna consciousness and natural medicine. I only have one religion, Krishna consciousness. So we'll stop here. Thank you all very much. As Elvis used to say, you've been a great audience. <laughs>